on tap today, we have author Steve Rubin. How are you doing? I'm great, Aaron. Thank you very much. Happy, happy new, new world. That is the best way to put it. It is a new world, or at least it's newer than it was not too long ago. <laughs> and I find it interesting. I'm, I'm coming to you out of a mutual love of James Bond, where you see end of the world scenarios over and over again. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's funny to go back to that being fiction. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree completely. Let's, let's, let's focus on the world of make-believe. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I actually just watched The Living Daylights the other day, just out of fun, because I've seen it before, obviously, but it was just time to give that one another spin. You know, I, uh, Timothy Dalton brings up a lot of uh, interesting uh, commentary. Um, he's a fine actor. Believe mm -hmm. me, he's a very, uh, very good actor. I just didn't think he was James Bond. I thought that uh, he was a little too serious. Now, I, I'm not saying that he, he should go back to the lightness of Roger Moore, who I also felt was the wrong James Bond, even though he was very successful at it. I have the twin, in my mind, the twin bookends are Sean Connery, Daniel Craig. To me, they're, they're the consummate Bonds. You know, serious, but not too serious. Ha they also have, um, the, that, that je ne sais quoi, you know, that, that, that kind of aura about them that just, uh, just made them James Bond. And Timothy did a very good job. I just don't think he did as good a job as Sean Connery and Daniel Craig. That's fair. And I mean, the, the, the first argument every James Bond fan has is who is the best, who is the worst Bond. And I am an out and out Dalton fan but it hurts because he only had two movies, so you don't really have a lot to build off of from that. No, that's so true. And I thought License to Kill was not a very good Bond movie in that the subject matter was just like a extended episode of Miami Vice. I mean, it just didn't have the qualities for me that make a good James Bond movie. The, the amazing locations, the just the whole kind of thrill a minute story I just thought it was just a little too dark but still you know very well made and there's there's lots of things to be thankful for I thought Carrie Lowell was terrific in License to Kill and I thought Robert Davi was the perfect uh, villain for that piece it just uh it just didn't fly for me and I'm already getting the sense that if you and I were to sit down with a couple of beers we would actually have a lot of fun disagreeing on some stuff because it, I know where you're coming from and I'm loving it. But what do you think does make a good Bond movie? What, what are the best of the Bond moments out there? Well, over the years, I think I've come to the conclusion that uh, the villain has to be terrific. I mean, for my money, the first James Bond movie I ever saw was Goldfinger in the theaters, Christmas 64. I was uh, 12. And it had a tremendous impact on me. And I think over the years, Goldfinger has become, for me, the archetypal James Bond villain. Uh, you know, a little larger than life, but not fantasy. Uh, the best Bond movies are the Bond movies that have the best villains. So that's where you start. Now, obviously, you got to have the right James Bond, and that's, that's, that's obviously a key here. But uh, it doesn't help to have a great James Bond, a lousy villain. Uh, for instance, Quantum of Solace, the second Daniel Craig. I thought after, after Daniel Craig came out like gangbusters in Casino Royale and arguably the best Bond movie from my sense since Goldfinger, it fell down in Quantum because um, uh, Matthew Amalric's dominant green character was just kind of a businessman who was working for Spectre as we later go on but a bland villain. Agreed. And then uh, in, the next, in the next film, you've got uh, uh, Javier Bardem's Raul Silva, who was a terrific villain. So uh, for me, Skyfall works really well. Um, I'm not a huge fan of um, Christoph Waltz's Blofeld. I just didn't, didn't think it filled the screen for me, but some people like him. I, he's, he's probably one of our best character actors right now. I just think the uh, reimagining Blofeld as James Bond's foster brother was just too much of a stretch for me. Yeah, uh, it, it kind of, to me, was that imperfect way of going back to Goldfinger, uh, Goldeneye when, you know, we 
brought in the, the death of his parents and we tried to tie that into his recruitment and it it seemed to work in GoldenEye. It didn't work so much better in the later movies, trying to fill in James Bond mystery family life. You know, I, I, I grew up a history buff. You know, mm -hmm. I studied history at UCLA. My first books are history books on film. Um, I like when movies tap into their own history and certainly the Bond movies with a 50 plus year history have a lot of history to tap into. At times, it works beautifully. I mean, For Your Eyes Only starts really wonderfully when, when Roger goes to visit uh, Tracy's grave. Of course, that teaser disintegrated rapidly with that goofy helicopter thing, but that's neither here nor there. Um, in Honor Majesty's Secret Service, when Lazenby retreats to his office and starts pulling props out of his desk, you know, the... The Strangler Watch him from Russia with Love, the Rebreather from Thunderball. Um, uh, uh, excuse me, Ursula Andress's uh, Honey's Belt uh, with a knife in it from Dr. No. Uh, those are wonderful moments. I love that kind of stuff. And of course, recently uh, they've given Daniel Craig back the old Aston Martin at times, which has been great. I mean, talk about iconic uh, uh, material. Um, but sometimes it doesn't doesn't work as well. And inventing this relationship between him and Blofeld just didn't work for me. But listen, <laughs> they keep trying. Uh, one of the challenges these days, as we are in the 21st century, is how do you make a James Bond movie? They've done films for 50 years. Can we still make it fresh? And uh, I give the Bond producers a tremendous a lot of credit because they always produce a very big film what in industry parlance in Hollywood is called a tent pole, you know, a big release for the year that, you know, helps your balance sheet considerably. And of course the Bond movies have always been very successful, um, but it's getting tougher and tougher. Back in the sixties, they didn't have to compete with Mission Impossible, the Bourne series, the Kingman series, even the Fast and the Furious series. When you want to do a car chase in a movie, including in a Bond movie, you got to compete now with Fast and the Furious, where they do things with cars, which are incredible. So I, I actually, when I when I saw Spectre in 2015, I thought their car chase, having seen a bunch of the, you know, the Fast and the Furious movies, I thought the car chase in Spectre was kind of low octane. I can definitely see where you're coming from there. And I, I share some of your frustrations at that, the later Bond movies, just trying to pack in so much action, sometimes at the expense of story, um, I, I definitely would like to ask where your thoughts are on, if you look at the pre-Daniel Craig James Bond movies before the quote unquote reboot, do you think they work better assuming a solid continuity from the beginning to the end where, you know, granted you have a 40 year history with one character or is that just too much of a leap? That's a very good question. I think that they, they handled it brilliantly with Daniel Craig because they kind of subtly rebooted the series. I mean, he hasn't, doesn't even have his double O number when Casino Royale begins, which I thought was terrific. And I think that, um, I think given the long history with Bond and its reputation, I think the fans will go along with a reboot as long as it turns into a terrific story. And obviously in Casino Royale, uh, they had classic Fleming material. I mean, that was his first novel, which had been done previously as either a, a kind of a low rent TV show back in the 50s. And then of course the 67 spoof with Woody Allen and David Niven and Peter Sellers. So it was time to get, the, get it right. And I thought they did a brilliant job. I mean, Casino Royale kind of got us all very excited about the Bond series, uh, very much so, more than ever. Um, so I, I, you know, I think the fans will go along with the reboot. Obviously, we're going to get a new James Bond with the next Bond movie after this one finally gets released. So they may have to do another reboot. Um, the double O number um, can be given to other people although he still will be called James Bond. So it doesn't, it does invite uh, a certain level of, uh, you know, kind of uh, tongue in cheek in terms, of, okay, it's a new Bond. And then we accept that. I thought, I always thought it was funny in the George Lazenby's film that he turns to the camera in the teaser and says, this never happened to the other guy. It's great. 
We love that. That, that that's that 10 seconds where you're allowed to step outside the movie and like you said later on he he acknowledges what happened in in earlier movies so it's it it becomes that character but for just a half a second he's right there with the audience exactly exactly and uh i interviewed richard maybaum back in the 80s and um richard said he said listen you guys know it's a new bond we know it's a new bond let's just break that, you know, that break that third wall for a second and look at the camera. And it was just, uh, it just was perfectly done. Maybaum was a wonderful writer who originally was a playwright. My friends and I, when we get together to discuss Bond, we can quote dialogue from all the Connery Bonds. But since the Connery Bonds and since the last one, uh, and I don't consider Never Say Never Again within the main cycle, it's just kind of a kind of a remake of Thunderball, but the dialogue was very quotable. And I miss that quotable dialogue. I miss the scene structure. If you think about it, movies today, and not just the James Bond movies, movies are no longer about dialogue. They're about action and special effects. So, you know, whereas I could, I not only can quote the Connery Bond films, but I can quote a Raiders of the Lost Ark or a Ghostbusters or you know, Back to the Future. Uh, we can run those movies almost in our head completely. I find the big disappointment for me today, and this kind of applies to the Craigs, even though the Craigs have been great for the most part, there's not memorable dialogue anymore. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't quote a line from Spectre to save my life right now. And I like Spectre. I really did. Um, I, I, my favorite of the Craigs is Skyfall, but Sky, uh, Spectre is probably right there behind it. And I, true, can't really quote anything from it. Yeah, it, the, the style has changed. It's The dialogue services the action. It doesn't stand on its own. I mean, it's a different style. I mean, back in the 60s, when Maybaum was writing the Connery Bonds, at least the first four or five, um, there just was a real coolness about the turning of the phrases and the use of what they call throwaway humor. I mean, Connery, you know, Connery uh, manages to uh, defeat the hearse going over the cliff in Dr. No. The construction worker walks over and says, what, how did it happen? And he looks at him very seriously and says, I think they were on their way to a funeral. I mean, that's called throwaway humor. It's like, I mean, we can laugh. And I remember, I think it was Maybaum told me when Ian Fleming saw the first few Bond movies, he was surprised that people would laugh because he didn't write them at all funny in the books. But Maybaum inserted what, what, what I consider to be crucial humor. And, uh, you know, and that I thought was just wonderful. Now, it got, got a lot funnier in the Roger Moore era. You know, uh, Roger was... Uh, really at heart a light comedian so he could he could do things that Connery would have never done and I have to say whether you like the uh, the Moore films or not they brought in a huge new audience uh, during the 70s and 80s the Roger Moore films got bigger and bigger and the box office got bigger and bigger I think culminating I think it was either Moonraker or Octopussy was the most successful film of that period yeah. And at the same time, in the 70s, you're looking at trends like you know, the, the just for one example, the Star Wars movies, which are bringing in all sorts of movie numbers. It starts to be very difficult to keep James Bond in the conversation when so many other things are happening in cinema. Um, so whatever they had to do to keep eyes on James Bond was probably worth it. It wasn't financially. I think that um... For my money, James Bond should never go into space. It was a little bit of a stretch for me. And I know that they were trying to compete with Star Wars because Moonraker comes two years later. And uh, it just uh, <laughs> it just didn't quite work for me. Although they're, you know, like a lot of the Moors though, they those are big, big productions with a lot of production value. So, uh, but uh, there's certain things that Bond should not do. He shouldn't go into space and he shouldn't be driving an invisible car. I would agree with both of those things. <laughs> I bet that was always the point where I, I kind of step away from Moonraker. It's like, oh, okay. It's, I know what they're doing, but it doesn't work. Yeah, although it was such a hit. And in fact, uh, they, I think they brought back, they did bring back the Jaws character and Jaws, who was kind of a goofy element of the spy who loved me, didn't quite work for me there either, but the fans just love 
Jaws. I mean, Richard Keel's character was a was a big hit, so they brought him back in Moonraker, made him a good guy in the end, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, just uh, they were really doing a lot of tongue and cheek in those days, and then th it's because they had Roger in the lead. I mean, Roger lend himself to those kind of moments. Uh, you know, you punch the computer, and it's the uh, the little computer code from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. They played the Magnificent Seven theme. I think one of the low points for me was in A View to a Kill when they opened that ski chase at the beginning with Beach Boy music, and I. I said, give me a break here. That's that's <laughs> that's not right. It's you you actually can't watch the Roger Moore films these days because after Daniel Craig has rebooted the series as being serious Bond, it's hard to look at that stuff. It, it is, although you know, since you and I go back, well, you go back further than I do, but I, I've been a Bond fan for a while. I, I remember at the high points and when people thought it was a bit campy and like Jaws, for example. I always thought Jaws was one of those characters who just works better as an idea than he did in a specific role. That's why I don't mind him coming back in Moonraker because it was just fun to have him play a part on the screen. You didn't really need to have him stuck in his little villain role there. And there are a lot of characters I kind of see in that regard. Um, Odd Job being another one. Just, just You just like the idea of Odd Job more than just the, his few scenes in Goldfinger. Ah, ah. <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah i uh, and then of course you had sheriff jw pepper and live and let die perfect and example <laughs> just shows up for no reason in the following movie it makes no sense but you just need those few minutes to, to cut the tension oh sure sure i i agree i agree i think that uh you know, uh, I don't think it would work so much in the Daniel Craig's, uh, you know, but I think that uh, we'll see why, well, you know, the Daniel Craig's are kind of over now. We'll see one more movie and then we'll see what's going to happen next. Uh, uh, I, I am very much looking forward to the new Bond movie, No Time to Die, I, if, we'll, if we'll ever get a chance to see it. I mean, it's been postponed now three times. So we got together over the fact that you are the author of the James Bond movie encyclopedia, which obviously you're qualified to write and you must have had a great time writing it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, my my uh, involvement in writing books about James Bond goes back to the 70s. I first started interviewing the filmmakers in 1977, the year of Star Wars. I went over to London. I had a uh, I had interviewed Cubby Broccoli in L.A. and he gave me an introduction to Michael Wilson, and they opened their files to me back in 77, that wonderful summer. So I had a great deal of information. So that 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 was. Uh, the information that led to my first book, uh, the James Bond films uh, behind the scenes history, which was published in 81, updated in 83. And that was more of a history of the Bond movies. Uh, I was approached in 1990 to wrote, write the encyclopedia, the James Bond movie encyclopedia by Contemporary Books of Chicago. And uh, they had had success with a Marilyn Monroe encyclopedia and Elvis Presley encyclopedia. And so they wanted a Bond encyclopedia, and I've been writing them ever since. This latest one, which came out in November, is the fourth edition. Awesome, awesome. And when you're covering the James Bond movies, are you looking at literally any, is it like almost a, a paper wiki, or are you trying to get a, a cohesive idea on each character? Well, my responsibility as an encyclopedia writer is to do a formal entry for everything I can do a formal entry for. So every actor of note who was in the Bond movies has his own entry, his birth date, his birthplace, background, additional credits, something if he interacted with other Bond players at some point, I have it in there. Interesting facts about them and then there are characters as well. There are character bios, there are actor bios, there are uh, equipment bios, whether it's weapons, cars, locations, trivia, dialogue, uh, all sorts of information. I, my design is to entertain the reader with something on every page, plus over 400 photos, many of which they've never seen before. So when you're looking at, it's essentially a way of three-dimensionalizing the Bond universe in a way that the movies themselves on their own can't. It is, and it's it is, the movie, the, the book is really designed as kind of a uh, a showcase book to just just showcase the things we love about the Bond movies. Uh, you know, uh, looking at the photos, triggering a memory, uh, lots of beautiful girls' pictures. That doesn't hurt. 
Never and does. Lots of lots of lots of great shots of the various bonds and really interesting facts and trivia that perhaps you didn't know. So my my goal was to give you almost something in every entry that perhaps you didn't know. And uh, I, I um, the reaction so far has been terrific. Um, I had to launch a, a kind of a worldwide hunt for the photos because I go right to archives and sources around the world. And I think my photo collection this time is the best ever, not only uh, because we have color for the first time, but I also was get I, I was able to get uh, artists, two major artists, Jeff Marshall and Brian May, to let me use some of their evocative artwork, their conceptualizations of what a James post James Bond poster could look like. So you're you're dealing with not just the the films themselves and the actors, but also conceptual art and early poster ideas as well. Well, not so much that as just uh, individual artistic approaches to the character. Ah, okay. Jeff Marshall just has a way of just doing some wonderful work uh, uh, with the actors. I mean, he did a portrait of, uh, of uh, Eva Green from Casino Royale, just a gorgeous portrait of her. I put that in the book. I got a gorgeous portrait of his of uh, Diana Rigg from Honor Majesty's Secret Service and just some really nice stuff. And um, uh, I'm very pleased with the visual of the book. I was always kind of a little bit disappointed that I couldn't use any color in my previous encyclopedias because the official Bond books come out and they're obviously very dazzling. But I think as an outsider, and I've always been an outsider historian, I'm not doing this for Eon, I'm doing this on my own, that I've brought something different to the table. So when you're looking at the when, when you're looking at these individual characters, let's say Blofeld, just for one example, and you're making an entry on Blofeld, how much do you lean on what's strictly in the movies and scripts and how much do you incorporate stuff from outside the movies themselves? Things like for the early things like the books and for later entries, like maybe even the video games. I'm strictly movie oriented. Strictly movie. Uh, yeah, I don't get into the books uh, other than obviously having a very nice entry on Ian Fleming. Uh, or if there's something that I need to tell people about uh, uh, that's related to a book element, but uh, very little on the books and uh, virtually nothing on the games. Uh, it's really just the, the main Bond films, although I have, uh, I have entries for Never Say Never Again and for Casino Royale, both, both the previous versions, just so we can have them in the book. Fair enough. Anything on Operation Kid Brother? Uh, I mention it, uh, certainly a uh, number of actors. Okay, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I, I just had to know if it got even so much as a nod. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. So um, with the book, is it out yet? I, I did a little research on it, I didn't see if it was, uh, it was available for sale just yet. Yes, uh, the James Bond movie encyclopedia is available. It came out November 14th. Uh, so it's been out uh, for a while and you can get a book at your local bookstore, hopefully, or on Amazon. Uh, I'm working out a promotion with uh, the classic movie bookshop in Hollywood, uh, Larry Edmonds, uh, which is like the book central for movie books. And um, if anybody wanted a, a, a autograph copy and they can order it through Larry Edmonds and that's E-D-M-U-N-D-S.com, LarryEdmonds.com and then I go down there uh, uh, frequently and I'll sign a book to them and it'll get shipped directly to the people who want it. I'll make sure I put that in the show notes of my website, aaronbossig.com, because as a guy who appreciates signed books, if somebody does want to take that up, uh, opportunity to get one, I want to give them that. Oh, sure. Sure. No, absolutely. And uh, I go into bookstores and sign, although I haven't been going into a lot of bookstores um, because of COVID, et cetera. Okay. Well, I know you're up against the time crunch, so I don't want to keep you longer than I have to, but is there uh, any more social media links you could drop or any places people could follow you online? Sure. Well, I, to promote the book, uh, I do something on Facebook called This Day in James Bond Movie History. In fact, uh, we're doing the interview today. We're celebrating two birthdays today. We're celebrating Telly Savalas, who unfortunately passed away in 1994, but we're celebrating the anniversary of his birth. And Michael Wilson, the producer who produces the Bond series with Barbara Broccoli, he's celebrating a birthday today. 
Uh, so I do that uh, regularly, usually twice a week uh, on uh, two Facebook pages. Well, actually, there are a number of Facebook, but my own Steve Rubin, R-U-B-I-N. And then I have a Facebook page called the James Bond Movie Encyclopedia. So that's one way of reaching out to me. Uh, I also am on um, LinkedIn, uh, Steve, Steve Rubin on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, Instagram. Um, I don't do much tweeting but I do a lot of Facebook posting. Uh, I'm a working film historian, so I, I'm always reviewing classic films on Facebook and uh, developing some ideas. I also, uh, I'm very heavily into writing and producing in LA. I've produced five films, three narrative features and two docs, and I'm, I've written a lot of um, uh, spec scripts of late with two different partners. We're out there every day trying to sell. I've been focusing on comedy. Uh, which is worlds away from Bond, but uh, we feel that the comedy genre has gone kind of fallow in the movie business. Uh, if generally, if you're going to watch a comedy, it's pretty raunchy. Mm -hmm. um, I, we're kind of, we're, we're, our inspiration was films like Back to the Future, Ghostbusters, Night at the Museum, family adventure films that can be fun. Dude, you are talking my language. I have said on at least two other podcasts in the last month that good comedies just haven't been made for the like past 15 years at least that's a conservative estimate it's like i think of good comedies and i think of back to the future ghostbusters a fish called wanda my cousin Vinny, blazing saddles i mean these movies just are not made today for various reasons and i will i want to know what those reasons are because those are very those are very good good comments uh, it's very frustrating because billy reback who's my writing partner billy billy comes from home improvement the tv series with tim allen he wrote for a lot of disney channel shows and we've known each other for many years and uh, we came together on a time travel column uh, comedy just right out of back to the future style and uh, generally we keep track of all the comedies come out that come out and we read the reviews and they are so atrocious in terms of the critical reaction. It inspires us to say, we can get, we can get our stuff made. We're just gonna have to keep pushing. The problem with a screenwriter in Hollywood today is that writing the script isn't enough. To get it any type of attention, most often you have to find a director who believes in it, who's done pre previous comedy work. Now, I would maintain that the number of comedy directors in Hollywood is much smaller than it was 10, 15 years ago. So the ones who are working are developing 10 of their own projects. So mm -hmm. it's very hard to suddenly show up and say, hey, we've got a great new comedy here, but we've got some stuff in play now that I really think can break out. And once we sell one, I think we can sell the inventory just we get in the door there. I, I, I used to work for John Hughes Back in the day, I was uh, when I was a publicist for Paramount. I worked on Pretty in Pink, uh, and uh, John Hughes was just started, just getting going at that time. He had done Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club, but he had written like seventeen comedies, and he said that once they get a couple out, all of a sudden they want the inventory. So that's our goal. Uh, but I'm not saying it's any easy duck walk here because you have to line up all those little elements. Yeah, and just. That's the frustrating thing for me is as somebody who likes those kinds of movies, I can't find them when I go looking for them. And I, I love my Star Wars and my Marvel movies and all that. I mean, I'm a big fan, but I like to just sit and laugh sometimes too. I just want I just want a silly movie sometimes and they're not there. No, it's funny because we, when, when somebody says, can you watch a, my son who's 22, he, he's a big film buff and he's probably watched every single movie of the last 20 years, it seems. And, we're always trying to find a comedy. Is there a comedy out there? Because this is another thing about Hollywood today. How many movies are dark? Uh -huh. Most movies are really dark. Now, there, there can be very good movies and they're very real, but generally they're kind of depressing, particularly end of the year movies. So, I mean, I light a candle to anybody who can get a movie made anytime, but enough already with dark movies. Can we have something a little light? Can we have something a little you know, fun. Um, what, what did I see? I just watched a movie the other night called Palm Springs. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's an Andy Sandberg comedy. It's it's kind mm -hmm. of another variation of Groundhog Day. Okay. Which which is a, a kind of a plot thing that they've kind of done to death, but you know, they got it. I thought actually, I found it kind of amusing. And then going back over the past year, um, 
the, the other thing I talk about, in addition to wanting comedy to come back and less, you know, lighter movies, just fun movies. You know, I, I grew up going to the movies to have fun. Mm -hmm. I never came out of the movie depressed, never. I never got too heavily involved in something to the point where I said, oh my God, that's much too dark for me. And I think when people go to the movies, and I don't know if it's changed, but I really think that people go to the movies to escape their day to day. They really want to be transported. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the movies that have been successful. I mean, the Marvel films, the Star Wars films, you know, they transport you to places. And whether you like the movies or not, they are adventure films and they're part of the, the, the history of Hollywood that goes back to Robin Hood and, you know, and the early James Bond movies. So I really kind of miss fun. Last year, I think the most fun I had the movies was seeing the Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which got very dark in that movie, but I still found it to be fun the way he kind of looked at Hollywood 1969. And I found that to be a real satisfying movie for me because being a film buff and a history buff, it was kind of where I grew up. Yeah, I, I, I think about those core movies that really used to get me excited about watching movies as a kid, things like, the first Superman or the Muppet movie or uh, the uh, Ghostbusters again or Back to the Future where I would not know what was going to happen. It was like I, I had this story and I, it was taking me for a literal r ride. And today, if I go to a Marvel movie, just pick on them a little bit more because they got enough money, they can take it. Um, it's like I know what I'm going to see. I know how it's going to be done. I know the look and the feel and the tone and the mood. And the only surprise I might have is, oh, they worked in this character and I didn't think that was going to happen. Okay, but yeah, you know I, where I'm going with this. Yeah, no, I go. I know where you're going with this. I mean, I uh, there have been some pluses, but I'll tell you, one of my biggest disappointments this season was seeing the sequel to Wonder Woman. I thought the first Wonder Woman was actually a lot of fun. I thought, mm -hmm. I mean, Gal Gadot is just stunning and she's still stunning, but what a dog of a movie. I just thought it was just terrible. And uh, I have to tell you that the other movie I saw recently that uh, really I rag on is uh, Christopher Nolan's latest movie, Tenet, which I, I, I still, I'm still wondering what I spent two and a half hours watching. And I'm a Nolan fan. I was a big Inception fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like a lot of his work. I thought Dunkirk was really interesting. But I just, uh, I, <laughs> I think that uh, somebody's, whereas television has gotten very good. I think there's a lot of great television on there. If you, if you can't find great television, you're living in a submarine. But the movie business is seems to be divided with tentpole Marvel movies and then 20 depressing movies at the end of the year with very little in between. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think we can do better. And I'm hoping once COVID's over that we can get back to some fun movies. And I'm going to do my little part to try to make one of those or two or 10. I want to keep an eye on that, knowing that this is what you're after and this is the kind of movie you're going for. You definitely have a fan in me and I want to check and see what else, what's going to come out from you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate that. You know, every fan counts and, uh, you know, you just have to keep pushing that peanut uphill every day and things, good things are, can happen. I mean, I've discovered in Hollywood that if you have a good idea, uh, you need a lot of support, but eventually it can see the light of day. And uh, I, I'm optimistic. That's not something you hear a lot these days. You're optimistic. Yes, so. yes, absolutely. Um, Man, I would love to get you back on and talk about just comedy, about just writing. Sure. And, and you know, James Bond would be great too, because I'm always a James Bond fan. But knowing that this is what you're trying to make, I, I definitely want to swing back and put a pin in this. I'm there, man. I can talk about it till the cows come home. Fantastic. Well, how about we, we wrap this up for now and we set something up for down the road? Sounds good. Yeah.